What's going on, bibliophiles? Welcome back to Poetry and Prejudice. Today, we're gonna to be reading another spectacular poem. We are going to be reading Bean Eaters by Gwendolyn Brooks, a poet who one of my literature professors once described as being the most natural of American poets. And I think that you guys are gonna really see how that's the case in this poem. But let's crack into the reading. The Bean Eaters. They eat beans mostly this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chip wear on a plain and creaking wood, tin flatware. Two who are mostly good, two who have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away and remembering, remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases, and fringes. Let's read this line by line. The first line reads, they eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Very simple sentence, but it tells us quite a bit if we know how to interpret it. So the first thing, the first part of this sentence is, they eat beans mostly. Now, what are we to infer from that? I would infer that in all likelihood, and we'll talk about this more as the details kind of build up, but I would infer that they eat beans mostly because they, in all likelihood, can't afford anything else other than beans. Beans are a cheap food for a lot of people, and you're able to buy it in bulk. They eat beans mostly. Who is it that eats these beans? This old yellow Hair. So that's a very strong, simple, but beautiful image of this pair, this couple, old yellow, right? I imagine someone who is old, in all likelihood, she's talking about an older white couple, and they're yellow. And you'll notice that sometimes as people grow older, particularly when they are white-skinned, they will kind of develop this yellowish tinge to their skin. And I think that's what she is pointing out here, the speaker is pointing out here says then dinner is a casual affair dinner is a casual affair because it's not something that is a celebratory thing that this couple does right i assume that when they were younger if they were together when they were younger dinner was a special affair it's something that they would do together they might go out to dinner and it would be you know as i said special be an event, if you will. But now, now that they're older, dinner, having dinner together is just something that is regular and usual. Then we have a description of the utensils that they're using to eat. Plain chip wear on a plain and creaking wood. So plain chip wear. This is a little bit of a play on words here. So we might call what people would eat off, off of something like dishware. But rather than saying dishware, the speaker here plays with it a little bit and says chipware to signify, of course, that the, uh, the dishware that they are using is chipped. It's certainly not new dishware. So we get the sense once again that this couple is in all likelihood very, very poor. And that continues on throughout the line. Plain chip wear on a plain and creaking wood. So we have the sense here that they have a table that they're eating off of, and this is described as plain creaking wood. So once again, it's not a new table. It might in all likelihood be a makeshift table that maybe the man himself kind of put together for them to eat off of. And then it says tin flatware. So I believe that this is a reference to the, the specific utensils. So they don't have gold forks and spoons and knives. Rather, theirs are made of tin. Continuing on to the second stanza. Two who are mostly good. Now, mostly good is here capitalized to emphasize it, of course. These two are mostly good because they are, in all likelihood, just like everybody else. Most people, I would argue, are mostly good. Nobody is perfectly good. Everybody has a little bit, a dose, a drop of evil in them. But like most people, they are mostly good. Two 
who have lived their day. Now, this doesn't require very much interpretation. They've lived their day in the sense that they've already lived out the prime of their lives. But keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away. So here, the, the third line starts with but. And but is a word here that is drawing out a distinction or rather a contrast between what's said before and what's being said now. Two who have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away. What does this mean? In all likelihood, it means that they've lived out the parts of their lives that are most fulfilling and exciting. Yet, nonetheless, despite that, despite the fact that those days have passed, here they are continuing to do those things which we would consider to be rote or routine, right? They just continue to do the little small daily task we all do, such as putting on their clothes and then putting things away, right? Getting dressed and cleaning their house. Continuing on, speaker says, and remembering, and here we have an ellipsis, right? Giving us a moment to pause, a moment to, moment to think, and remembering, right? You almost kind of like muse as you say it, as you wait for the next line. Remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases, and fringes. So what is it here that they are remembering? The speaker never says. Beginning of the first and second line of the third stanza, the speaker says, and remembering, ellipses, we pause, remembering with twinklings and twinges. And then they, there is, there's a description about how it is that they're going about remembering whatever it is that they're remembering, but we're never told exactly what it is. I suspect here that they are remembering a time when they were younger and they felt full of life and felt perhaps excited about life, perhaps even excited about each other in a way that you only can when you are, let us say, virile, when you're young and healthy. But now that time has passed. And what do they have? Here they lean over this table, which is a plain and creaking wood, and they're in a rented back room, so they don't own their own house. In all likelihood, they're renting a back room from somebody else who does own the house, and they just have these little sort of knickknacks or mementos, if you will. Beads, receipts, dolls, cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases, and fringes. So what are these things? Pretty much nothing, right? They're small little items that in all likelihood for this couple have some sort of sentimental value. They're the things that they have kept that remind them of times, times past, perhaps. But they don't have anything of significant value. But nonetheless, what they do have is they have each other and they have the memories of when they were younger. And this is the twinklings and the twinges. So what wisdom, if any, can we glean from the bean eaters, from this portrait of this old yellow pear? Most modern poems, thematically speaking, are more descriptive than prescriptive, which is to say, in essence, that they strive more to describe how human beings do behave in the world, as opposed to trying to tell us how it is that we should behave in the world. The Bean Eater seems to be more of the former category, seems to me to be describing how human beings do behave. Now, I would say that this poem speaks to an experience or experiences that we will have when we grow older. And if you strip away some of the surface details, you can kind of see the universality, so to speak, of the meaning of the poem. It might not be the case that when we are older, should we be graced to live as long, that we won't be as poor as this couple. It might not even be the case that we find a life partner that we are going to grow old with. But in all likelihood, it will be the case that we will be like this couple in the sense that the only thing that we will have when we are older is our memories. We are going to sit like them at some point, remembering, remembering, with twinklings and with twinges, those periods in our life when we were young, 
youthful, vital, excited about life, optimistic perhaps about the future. Perhaps we will even remember those times where we were young and in love as you may be now, right? So it seems to be describing how it is that human beings are in relationship to time. We will at some point grow old if we are graced by God to live long enough. And when we grow old and we are not as vital, the only thing that we will be left with is our memories, our memories and our mementos, much like this old yellow pear. I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. You guys tell me what it is that you think about this poem and what you think about my analysis. Otherwise, if you enjoyed this content, hit that like button, smash subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can be informed when I drop more videos on poetry and prejudice. Until next time, bibliophiles.